David, a Philippine-American couple. Today, class, what I would like to do is talk to you guys about hand tools and power tools. This is uh, something that I, I taught for many years, and this information is out there at OSHA.gov. Um, free, of course, to everybody. None of it's uh, private. It's all good public information. So let's get started on hand tools uh, and power hand tools. Well, there's a lot of hazards associated with power tools or hand tools, as you can imagine. So one of the things we got to keep in mind is workers using hand and power tools may be exposed to certain hazards, right? So objects that fly, that fall, that are abrasive, that may splash. And then we got to worry about the dust, the fumes, the mist, the vapors, the gas, the heat, the frayed or damaged electrical cords, hazardous connections, and proper grounding. So we're going to talk a little bit more about those. Some of our biggest hazards when it comes to using electric power tools is the electrical component to it. So let's uh, maintain regularly, meaning we want to make sure our equipment is in good working order, um, that it is not rusted over, not got rained on and crudded. We want to use the right tool for the right job. Um, I remember my grandfather, when I was growing up as a kid, I was saying, remember, use the right tool for the right job. A rock isn't always a hammer. So <clears throat> we want to inspect our tools. Make sure they are safe. Operate according to manufacturer's instructions. This is one of the key, the biggest key that I would teach about safety hazards and OSHA violations. You have to use things in accordance with the manufacturer's specs or it can become an OSHA violation. And it's most definitely a safety hazard. So, and use the right PPE or personal per protective equipment. I know uh, people hate this one, but you must always keep the guards attached and use the guards. They're there for a reason, They're re they really are. Some hand tools. We gotta look for ones that are cracked. The jaws may be sprung, um, there's metals, pieces that are coming off from mushrooming the chisels. You don't want to misuse the tool, the right tool for the right job. Here it talks about a screwdriver is not a chisel. Tools with taped handles um, may be hiding cracks. This is something else that I would point out in my OSHA classes or to companies when I would go do consulting work was anytime there's tape on anything OSHA would look at that and go, ah, there must be a problem with it. There shouldn't be any tape on it. And it's just simply low hanging fruit. A big red flag that says, hey, come look at me. PPE, personal protective equipment. This is, is, is a great line of defense for yourself, all right? We got goggles and gloves, your clothing, jeans, shirts, long sleeve versus short sleeves, hard hats. We want to keep our working surfaces free of dust and debris, uh, tripping hazards, electrical cords, uh, strap metal, anything, wood, garbage, trash, soda cans. You got to keep your work areas nice and clean. You want to keep your tools sharp. You don't want to force those saws to cut through the wood or the metal. So power tools must have their guards. If not, you're not using it according to manufacturer specs. And they um, are extremely hazardous when used improperly. They're extremely hazardous when used properly. So just think about that. Different types determined by their power source. So basically we have some different energy sources. We have electric power tools, pneumatic, liquid fuel, hydraulic, 
and power actuated. So these are kind of like nail guns and saws and lips. Switches, handheld power tools must be equipped with one of the following. A constant pressure switch, which shuts off the power upon release. Just like your, your saws, you know, you pull the trigger, you let go, it shuts down. A on and off switch, which are like routers and planers, trimmers, shears, and jigs. You have to turn it off to power it down. Some precautions, let's think about this. We wanna make sure we disconnect them when they're not in use, before servicing and cleaning, and when changing the accessories. I know it's a bummer, but we really do need to unplug it to change the blades. I know we don't do that, but we have to do that. Keep people not involved in the work areas away from the work. If they're not supposed to be there, if they're not act actively working that job, then they don't need to be there. We want to secure our work to clamp your vices. Don't hold the switch buttons while carrying a plugged in tool. <laughs> Keeps tools sharp and clean. The part of the reason for keeping your tools nice and sharp is if your blades or your tools are not, it puts them under stress and you're going to actually cause your saw blades to explode. Consider your PPE, your clothing. Um, are you wearing too loose of clothing so it will get caught? Jewelry hanging down. Remove damaged uh, electrical tools and tag them out of use. And look guys, one thing you have to look at from one perspective is, let's say if I have a circular saw on my job site or in my factory, wherever, and the cord gets frayed and busted and I don't take it out of service, meaning throw it in the garbage, not just write a note on it, and somebody comes along and uses it and gets injured, I'm at fault. I'm at fault. It's the same thing. And, and I know this sounds counterproductive or intuitive, but if you have a saw that's broken, it needs to be broken, broken, broken and thrown in the garbage. That way an employee can't dig it out of the trash, take it home. There's been numerous lawsuits where an employee without permission went in the garbage, got something that was broken, took it home, used it, got injured, and sued the company and won. Power tools. We don't carry them by their cords. We don't use electrical cords to lower and uh, raise them up. We don't yank the cords to disconnect. Absolutely, we don't do that. We keep cords um, away from sharp objects to make sure they're not cut and frayed. To protect workers from shock, tools must have a three-wire cord plug into the ground receptacle. Be double insulated. Be powered by low voltage isolated transformer. And this is going to be really important. Most of the tools I know are bought in America. I don't know about you know, the Asian countries so much. But when I was there, I did do a lot of snooping and it looks like everything's double insulated. Now, in the United States, the underwriter laboratories will approve tools and you know for sure that is actually done versus maybe China. Some good practices. Understand the limitations. You know, if you got a saw like laying here and it only has a seven inch blade on it, you're not gonna be cutting through 10 inch wood. Use gloves and safety shoes. You want to store in a dry, cool, uh, clean place. If they're not approved for wet, look, wet work, don't use them in wet areas. Keep your work areas well lit. Ensure cords don't uh, present a tripping hazard to others. Now, if you have abrasive wheels or grinders, there's some things that are really important to understand about this. And I, I have some videos of people who have actually been, I have one video of somebody who was decapitated 
because of their grinder wheel exploding and coming and slicing through their neck. And I have other videos of people being impelled by grinder wheels. All right, so if you're looking at grinders, very important that the end spindles where the nuts go are covered. You gotta maintain uh, proper alignment with the wheel. You cannot exceed the strength of the fasteners. The guard so that minimum amount of the wheel is exposed. All right, now we need to check our wheels before mounting them, inspect closely for damage. And this is brand new or used. You need to make sure you inspect them right out of the pack. You can perform a sound or ring test, ensuring they're free of it. And what you do is basically just take like the end of a screwdriver and tap on them. And if you get a, a gently um, non-metallic instrument and you do this, the wheel sounds are cracked dead, don't use it. But it should sound, you tap it and it makes a nice smooth noise. If you tap it and it goes kind of like the instead of the, that's what you're <clears throat> that's what you're looking for. All right, a couple other things <clears throat> we got to make sure that we understand with this. We got to match the wheel, the speed of the wheel, to the RPMs of our grinder or our machine. So. Let's look at this. If we have a grinder, handheld or bench top mounted, it doesn't matter, that it is rated to go 4,000 RPMs, and we put a grinding wheel on it that only is rated to go 2,000 RPMs, what's gonna happen is that grinder wheel, that grinder machine is gonna spin that wheel so fast that it's gonna explode. So you got to make sure you get the right speeds, the right machines. So <clears throat> when we're looking at our grinders, we want to keep the work rest not more than one eighth of an inch from the wheel surface. So the key here is like right here. What we don't want to happen is for this gap to be so large that this tool will get stuck in here, flip up, and cause this wheel to shatter and bust all over you. So we got to make sure that our machine guards are on, that the guard is, that your belts are guarded, and that the gears, the shafts, the pulleys, sprockets, spindles, flywheels, anything that rotates and moves has to be guarded. So you'll see like, even in this picture here, uh, this is a rotational device, but this has guard. This is a guard. So we gotta have our guards in place and we don't wanna remove those. Now, part of it is we wanna make sure that our guards are actually guarding the point of contact. And as you can see in this picture here, um, we are right in that area. So this guard all through here is guarding us against that blade. This, if you don't know, our anti-kickback device, a lot of people call them dog ears. Um, they will allow the tool from kicking back or the, the material being worked on from kicking back onto you. Machine guards must protect the operator and those who work from it, the point of operation, in running nip points. So a nip point is anywhere that you can get your finger caught or a shirt or a cuff link or a piece of necklace. Rotational parts and have to protect you from flying chips. So like in here, this is all, these are all guard, all guard, all guard, all guard through here. So radial uh, saws, guarding, radial arm saw equipped with the upper and lower guards. This is the fixed guard. This guard here moves as you go along as you're cutting and pulls up, which helps protect your fingers and, uh, and other little body parts from getting stuck in there. 
So circular saws guard these saws above and below the base. So this, this is your base plate, all right? Here's your flexible moving guard that circles up around like this. And so when you come in contact with your material, this blade truly comes this way. Table saw. Here you got a hood guard, which protects you from that. Here's some more dog ears or dog legs, maybe. And maybe you've heard them called that. Pneumatic tools. They're powered by compressed air, includes nailers, staplers, chippers, drillers, and sanders. Main hazard is by getting hit by tool attachment or using the fastener. All right, there's actually a video out there of somebody who was shot through a wall, a, a plywood wall at a job site. Some, one guy was acting like a smart aleck, and there was a guy behind him on this side of the wall, and this idiot guy came up and took his nail gun and shot him through the sheetrock, uh, sorry, the, the plywood, and he was hit by it. There's actually several assault cases where people rig the guards to fire and they shoot at each other. So it can be done, it's stupid, but you gotta be aware that you need to once again use the right tool for the right job, the right strength and the right size nail. Because what this guy did was he put a big old like 16 penny galvanized nail through that and he shaved off the head and it literally went through and hit the guy. So where you connect your air to things, they need to be securely fastened so they can't, they can't pop loose. And most of these will have like a Carter key or something that allows them to be locked and latched. So here we have a hose clamp, which is unacceptable. You're not allowed uh, to use a hose clamp to fasten things. Here is a nice collar that has a pushback and these things will seat in here and lock into place. That's how you want to attach an air hose to a tool, not with this. So this is bad. <clears throat> Pneumatic tools, place a safety device on the muzzle to prevent the tool from ejecting fasteners. Install a safety clip and retainer to prevent attachments such as chisels or clipping hammers from being ejected. So, if they inject like this, they got to have a pin to hold that in. If not, it's like, even with like a jigsaw, most people have had a jigsaw. If you don't get that blade in all the way and get it latched and locked, the, the jigsaw blade pops out. It's the same principle. Of course, you always want to use your PPE. Compressed air. All right. We love compressed air. It's it's a miracle to, to work course. So now in the United States under OSHA guidelines, you're never allowed to use compressed air to clean yourself off with. Now, I know it's done all the time, but it is illegal. And let me tell you why. Because at 30 PSI, actually even a little bit lower than that, if you're dusting yourself off, woo -hoo, you know, and you get a piece of dirt, a piece of wood, a piece of metal, 30 PSI can cause that to lodge under your skin. That's why it's not allowed to happen. Liquid fuel tools, usually powered by gas. Uh, main hazard is fuse, fuel vapors, meaning that they can explode or catch on fire. Use only approved flammable liquid containers. Before refilling a fuel powered tool tank, shut down the engine and allow it to cool. I know that's time consuming, but if you don't, if you spill any of the fuel, you're going to have a catch on fire. 
All right, let's talk a little bit about power actuated tools. These tools are truly just like a handgun. A lot of them actually use a 22 cartridge shell or primer in them, so they really are like a gun. Um, you must be licensed and highly trained to use them. Test the tool each day before loading to ensure the safety device is working just like a firearm. You need to wear a suitable ear, eye, and face protection, hand protection. Uh, select a power level, and this is crucial when using these type of tools. If you have it have the power level setting too high and you're going through sheetrock, it's just going to go right, blow right through it. These are used for a lot like concrete work. So they're not actually designed to be used to put nails in walls and things. It will just truly just blow it all apart. So this is a fatal fact from OSHA, and this is a real case study, and I kind of mentioned this earlier. An employee killed when struck in the head by a nail fired from a power actuated tool. The tool operator was attempting to anchor plywood form for preparation of pouring a concrete wall. It blew through and the guy was killed. And this isn't the only case of this. There's been numerous cases over the years that I have found in my research where this has happened intentionally or accidentally. Avoid driving into materials that are easily penetrated unless they're uh, backed by something much stronger. Here we show, you know, basically just plywood and the hole that it makes when it goes through. You can see the cartridges here on the left. So we don't want to use, right? So don't use explosive or flammable atmosphere. Why? It's because like a gun, it has a muzzle flash, a little muzzle flash in the chamber, and it also can produce a lot of spark with impact, especially with metal to concrete. You want to make sure that you inspect it, that all moving parts operate freely, that the barrel is free from obstructions and has the proper shield, guard, and attachments. You don't want to load the tool unless you're using it immediately, so don't keep it loaded. It's kind of like a weapon. Don't leave a loaded tool unattended. Keep hands clear of the barrel. Never point the tool at anyone and store in a locked location. Jacks. Well, when we're using our jacks, we've got to keep up a couple things. We've got to make sure that the base that the jack is sitting on is wider and firmer to hold the weight and the compression of it. A lot of times, if you just stick a jack on the ground, it's just going to dig a little hole and just kind of bury itself into the ground. So firm level surface, you got to make sure it's centered, that the jack head is placed against a level surface. You apply the lift force evenly. So you want to do nice motions, not you want to do it nice and easy. And monitor it for slippage. That's the other thing that happens. Once you start putting a bunch of weight on the jack, sometimes you'll get slippage. So you got to watch for that. And that's and that's why you got to keep yourself clear of it also. Capacity should be known and marked on the jacks. The manufacturer rating capacity must be marked in all jacks and must not be exceeded. This is one of those um, real basic, look, here's how the manufacturer says to do it. If you violate this, then anything that happens after that is not on the manufacturer. It's due to your negligence. And that's a key factor in lawsuits and accident investigations. Blocking, <clears throat> cribbing, or blocking, immediately blocking the load after it's lifted. So once we get something up, we want to put a, the jack isn't permanent. The jack's job is to lift, and the blocking's job is to hold into place. Maybe that's a good way to look at this. All right, a little summary of what we've been discussing. Um... Hazards are usually the result of improper tool use. Remember, you got to use the right tool for the right job. 
not following one or more of these or all of these techniques, inspecting the tool. We, the hazards result when we don't inspect and realize that that hammer has a crack in it, or, you know, that uh, jackhammer is, has electrical short. We don't inspect it properly, we miss these. Not using the correct PPE, taking off the guards, which we all have a, a tendency to want to do, the improper storage of the tools, and using safe techniques. Um, another one is not using the tool the way the manufacturer has designed it to be used. All right, that's just a quick overview for you guys. Hope it's helpful. Feel free to share it. Feel free to like, subscribe, and share our channel, all that good stuff. And we will see you in the next class. Take care, guys.